الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا الكريم بصري. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Thank you all for coming tonight. We are doing a topic that I wanted to do for a really long time. Uh, some of you know that history is my area of specialty. It's a field that I'm very passionate about. Some of you have done my online history course. It's about 30 videos covering 1,400 years worth of history in 30 hours. Today we're going to attempt something a bit more challenging. Right, what I normally do in 30 hours, we're going to try and do it in one hour. So, this is a very quick snapshot of 1,400 years worth of history in one hour. I actually don't know if I can do it, but we're going to try and show There's a lot to cover. And I chose this topic because history, I think, is the one area of Islamic studies where <laughs> we do not have enough information in our local curriculums, right? Our local is, uh, history focuses mainly on the stories of the prophets, the seera, and at most of the Quran And that's understandable because that's the most important part of our history. That is actually the Islamic history. What we're looking at today is not the Islamic history, it's the political history of the Muslim world. It's what happened after that. What happened for the next 1,400 years, right? And so before we jump into it, I want to clarify a few important principles and theories that will guide your understanding of history. Because a lot of people, if they don't know Muslim history, when they first jump into it, it can be depressing, it can be shocking, because a lot of things, a lot of bad things happen in our history. Right? It's not all happy events, it's not all good. It's up and down, up and down, just like life. Right? In our lives, we have ups and downs, we have good times and bad times. Our history is the same. Every generation has ups and downs. So the number one principle to guide whatever we're going to go through today is that our religion is divine, our history is human. The Quran, the Sunnah, this is divine, this is our source of religion, this is where we take our, uh, our knowledge from. But our history is human. You'll find the majority of Muslims to live in our history are not awliya, they are not ulama, they're just the average person with the average life. They have good and bad about them. Number two, we live in a bubble of modernity which clouds our judgment of history. A lot of the problems people have with history is not really a problem with history, but that we're living in a very unique point in history, right? Like some people are shocked when they learn that Muslims conquered other lands, right? They're like, why are Muslims conquering? We're supposed to be the religion of peace. Uh, relax, conquest is part of every empire, right? <laughs> Including the Muslim empire, it's going to happen. So it's, it's our bubble of modernity that makes us look at these things like there's something strange about them, but within the context of history, it's quite normal, whether we're talking about conquests or some of the other things that happen in history. At the end of the day, our history is very human. Good things happen, bad things happen, well, boring things happen. Uh, you know, the average person in history had a very boring life. That's what we don't have right about them in the history books. You know, they're not, uh, we only really write about the bad things that happen. Think about it in our own lives, right? When you have a good month, and everything goes your way. You don't have anything to write about in your journal or diary. Right? But when you have a day where everything goes wrong, you can fill 20 pages about it. Our history is the same. Sometimes you talk about a Khalifa and he had a 20 year reign and nothing goes wrong and his biography is like two paragraphs. He ruled for 20 years and there was justice. Right? And then somebody else rules for two years and there's a variety of terrible events that take place and we have 50 pages describing those two years. So, History is a mixed bag. There's going to be good, there's going to be bad. And one more point to clarify before we jump into actual history. A lot of people approach history with the wrong theory in mind. Many of us, because of the liberal environment that we grow up in and study in, we have absorbed the, the liberal myths about history. The main myth about history that we have absorbed is the theory of progress. Right? The theory of progress is the idea that humans are getting better in every way with each passing year, right? That we are morally superior to the people who came before us. This is the theory of progress that liberalism is built upon, right? This is why they say things like, it's 2024, why do you still believe that? It's 2024, how can you still have that belief? This theory 
is fundamentally opposed to the teachings of Islam. Why? Because we believe that the best generation is who? Which generation is the best? Hmm? Rasulullah and the Sahaba. And after that, each generation gets a little bit worse in terms of their overall iman and practice. Not to say they aren't to be good people, but the further away we get from the time of Rasulullah the more morally corrupt society becomes. Right? So the theory of progress is completely a myth in the Islamic worldview. Rather, we believe the best of times in terms of morality, in terms of faith, in terms of piety, is the first generation of Muslims. And the further away we get from that, the closer we get to Qiyamah, the worse humanity gets. Right? And this is why we don't try to liberalize the deen. Because we know that what would save the later generation is what saved the earlier generations. So this theory contradicts a fundamental of our religion. Instead, I want us to look at history through two other theories. The first theory is what I just mentioned, the theory of spiritual decline which means that human piety peaked with the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba and every generation after that is not as pious collectively. Two evidences for this, the Hadith Khayrul Uruni Qarni, right? That the best of generations is my generation, then the one after them, then the one after them. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ tells us that it, there's a downward slope in terms of piety. Second proof of this surah, al waqiyah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the people of Jannah, He puts them into two groups, the pious and the average Muslim. With the pious, He says, Sulatu min al wa qalilu min al Many of the early Muslims were pious, in the end of time it will be very few. When it comes to the average Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after describing Jannah for them, He says, Sulatu min al wa sulatu min al There will be many in the early generations, and there will still be many in the later generations. What this these two verses of the Quran are predicting is that over time, Muslims will get more in number but less in piety, which we observe, right? So this is the theory of spiritual decline taken from this hadith and this verse of the Quran. The other theory I want you to keep in mind as we go through the ups and downs of history is the theory of cycles of power. This theory was initially uh, made popular by Ibn Khaldun uh, in his Muqaddama. So Ibn Khaldun looked at the time where the Andalusian Empire was in decline and he came up with this theory uh, which is that every empire goes through a rise, a peak and eventually a decline and this includes Muslim empires. Muslim empires are not immune to this and we see this happening over and over again in our history. So when we look at history we need to understand two things. The time of the Prophet and the Sahaba is the golden age in terms of piety. After that, we have a variety of empires. Every empire has their golden age. The golden age is not necessarily a golden age of piety, but a golden age of prosperity in terms of being the wealthiest, most powerful empire in the world. But then every empire also rises and falls. Right. So now, let's try and go over 1,400 years of history in 45 minutes. Right. Starting with the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm not going to go to the seerah, you all should be familiar with it. Uh, we'll do that, it'll take us another 60 hours. But we know Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes about at the time when there's two major empires, the Roman Byzantium Empire and the Persian Empire. Arabia is basically a, a bunch of tribes and villages. There's no real civilization there, there's no real structure or uh, community there in the, in, in the sense of what the Romans and the Persians were. Uh, Rasulullah is born in, Tum in Makkah. He preaches Islam there for 13 years. He's forced to make Israel to Yathrib, which becomes the Nabi. Then there is a war between Makkah and Medina for a few years, followed by a peace treaty, followed by the conquest of Makkah, followed by the conquest of the entire Arabian Peninsula, where idol worship is eradicated from Arabia. It becomes the land of Tawheed. And Rasulullah sallallahu passes away after 23 years of being a prophet. And uh, 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 21 uh, uh, years of being a prophet, and he uh, is at the age of 62 at the time and he passes away, and he leaves behind his Sahaba to continue his mission. 
right? This part of history we all know. We taught this in school, we taught this in madrasa. This is the most important aspect of history, the sira. If you don't know the sira, buy a book, download the podcast, attend the class. This is the most important part of history to study because this is where you take your religion from. You take your religion from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and his sahaba, not necessarily those who come after them. So after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa we have the period known today as the time of the Khulafa or Rashidin, the rightly guided Khalifas. Obviously when they were alive, they didn't call themselves the rightly guided Khalifas. They all just tried their best, right? And these are the five great Sahaba who ruled at the beginning, his difference of opinion are the rightly guided Khalifa two, three, four, or five. I'm listing five because of the hadith that the rightly guided Khilafat would last for 30 years. And really these five make up exactly 30 years, right? So this is the period of piety and the golden age of spirituality for the Ummah. This is when you have the best of the best living. Right? You have Abu Bakr, Umar, Usman, Ali, Hassan. But even besides them, you have Abu Bayda ibn Jarrah, you have Khalid ibn Walid. You have the Ummah at its best at this time. Abu Bakr is the first Khalifa, he rules for two years. There is a war against the apostates, there is a war against the false prophets. The jihad of expansion begins. They conquer parts of the Persian Empire, parts of the Roman Empire. And one of the most important things that Abu Bakr radiallahu started was the compilation of the Quran. Abu Bakr radiallahu passes away within two years. Umar radiallahu becomes the next Khalifa. From all of these reigns, the most important to study is that of Umar radiallahu anhu. Right? He rules for 10 years and a lot of important things happen in these 10 years that shape our understanding of Islam and our understanding of history. One of the main things that happens at this time is that there, this is one of two points in our history where the Muslim empire grows the fastest. Right? There are two points in history where the empire expands the fastest. The time of Umar and the time of Walid ibn Abdul Malik. So in the time of Umar, the Persians are defeated. The superpower of the world, the Persians, are completely wiped out. And all of those lands, Iraq, Iran, and all those surrounding lands, become part of the Muslim world, and they become Muslim lands. So the Muslims have defeated a superpower and taken over all of their lands. Likewise, from the Romans, they conquer Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and a variety of other lands as well. That whole area that we today call the Middle East becomes Muslim lands during the time of Umar Rajulahu Anhu. Umar Rajulahu lives a simple, pious life in Medina. There's lots of beautiful stories about his reign and amazing things that he did. Eventually, he is murdered in Medina and Osman Rajulahu becomes a Khalifa for about 12 years. In the first half, the conquest continue. The Muslims form their first navy. They start going over the ocean. They start fighting countries across the ocean. And the second half of his reign is a time of political unrest. So a lot of new people convert to Islam in faraway lands and rumors spread in those lands, negative rumors about Usman radiallahu anhu, people believing the rumors, they get riled up, rioting begins, looting begins, they get to Medina, they sack the house of Usman radiallahu in the month of Zulhijjah and they murder him in his home while he's fasting in the month of Zulhijjah. And this causes massive turmoil across the Muslim world because this is the first time in history that a Muslim ruler, a pious Muslim ruler, is killed by Muslims. So this plunges the Ummah into civil war, right? The death of Osman plunges the Ummah into civil war. He passes away, he is murdered. Ali Raja Anhu becomes the Khalifa, but not everybody accepts him as Khalifa, and the Ummah ends up being split. So we have now a period of civil war. Ali Raja Anhu first fights some of the Sahaba. Uh, his army rather fights some of the Sahaba's army over the, uh, some political issues. And then there's a massive war between him and Muawiyah Raja Anhu over the Khilafat. And Ali Raja Anhu is murdered by some extremists, the Khawarij. And his son Hassan comes into power. Hassan wanted nothing to do with all of this politics and civil war and infighting between Muslims. After six months, he gives up the Khilafat. He hands it over to Muawiyah Rajula Anhu, and the rightly guided era is over, and the Umayyad era begins. Just a couple of notes here. The rightly guided era is the most important part of our history to study after the time of the Prophet If you have not studied it, please make time to study it. Right? Number two, when discussing the differences between the Sahaba, even the civil wars between them, it is important that we maintain the adab and respect for all of the Sahaba. Right? And you do not 
vilify them or curse them or, or talk bad about them. You do it in a respectful way. It was a heated time. Everybody felt they were right. Everyone felt they were right in fighting for a just cause. And things happen. It's just the human nature. You see the human side of the Sahaba in times like this. So Muawiyah becomes the Khalifa and he has a 20 year reign of peace and justice, which is really uh, one of the best reigns uh, of the later era. But in his reign, the, the Ummah transforms. A lot of people find this transformation to be negative. I don't consider it negative or positive. I consider it necessary, right? That Muawiyah notices that there's a lot of infighting. Furthermore, the three Khalifas before him were assassinated. Right, so there's like this idea that the Khalifa is just sleeping in a masjid and being a person of the people. It's not working. They're getting assassinated like that. Right, so it makes sense that he makes some changes. Right, he gets bodyguards. Every Khalifa after this for the rest of our, our history has bodyguards. When you think about it realistically, three people before you were assassinated, it's realistic you're gonna get bodyguards. You're gonna start living in a in a palace. You're gonna start protecting yourself. Right, so it's the time of Muawiyah that really we see the the transformation of the Khilafat into a monarchy into an empire, uh, a empire-style monarchy very similar to the Romans. Uh, so basically they, they mirror some of the political ideas of the Romans and the Persians and the Muslims now become this empire. And yes, in terms of piety, the Khulafa or Rashidin era is better, but I don't think the Ummah would have survived and grown to the power that it did in the later times if they never really became this type of empire. Just to, just to survive all the wars that were to come with the Romans and with the, later on the Mongols and the, Crusade, the Crusaders, it needed the stability of how a monarchy ran. So it was, it is a very contested part of our history, whether the monarchy system is good or bad. I'm of the opinion that it is neutral, it is just a political necessity of that time and something that was needed uh, to maintain the stability of the empire. So we have the first monarchy. Now from this point onwards, our history is empires, it's monarchies, it's kingships. For the rest of our history, right till World War I. For 1,300 years, our history is empires. Each empire has a right, it has a peak, it has a golden age, it has a fall. The first empire is the Umayyads. The Umayyads, Banu Umayyah, are a branch of the Quraysh. Muawiyah and his descendants, and Marwan ibn Hakam and his descendants. They are a branch of the Quraysh. Right? And they essentially ruled the Ummah for about 90 years. It's a very short empire, but there's a bit of a plot twist there towards the end, we'll come to it in a bit. They ruled for about 90 years, and during this time, the Muslims really become a superpower. This is really a miracle if you think about it. Islam starts in the desert of Arabia, in small towns and villages, and within 80 years, it is a superpower. It is literally one of the mightiest empires in the entire world, right? So the Umayyads, particularly Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he turns it into a proper empire. He comes up with the idea of having an official language, having a flag, having their own currency. So before this, Muslims used Roman currency and Persian currency. In the time of Abdul Malik, they start to develop their own currencies, right? So it really becomes an empire at this time. It now has its own flag, it has the official Arabic language being Arabic, it has a, a tax system, it has an official army, it has borders with the other empires, it has peace treaties with other empires, it has its own currency. It's now really a global superpower. Uh, and this brings in a period of, for the first time in Muslim history, real material success. The Ummah becomes, especially the government, the Umayyads become wealthy overnight. And the Ummah has not experienced this before. So for many of the Umayyads, the, this wealth proves to be too much of a test for them, and they end up indulging in a very lavish lifestyle that upsets the ulama and the pious Muslims, right? Because again, imagine if you look during this time. You look through the time of Umar and Osman and Ali, and then a few decades later, your Khalifa is a wealthy man who drinks alcohol, right? It's, it's a huge shift, to, and this, is, this led to rebellions. This is why the empire never lasts very long. People rebelled against them. Other political parties rose up and gained a popular support, particularly the Abbasids, who then stage a coup, they take over the empire, they massacre the Umayyads, and the Abbasid empire begins. So, just a pause here again and take some notes on this. The Umayyads in general 
uh, are portrayed very negatively in our history, right? Mainly because most of the history books are written in the Abbasid era. So the Abbasid historians are going to portray the Umayyads negatively to justify the coup, right? In my opinion, there's not much difference between the Umayyads and the Abbasids. Their style of leadership is very similar. The Abbasids made a lot of false promises to come into power. A lot of false promises, right? They're very much like the politicians of today. That they promise they'll put someone from the Prophet's family in charge and they'll have a pious rule and they'll bring back the leader, ulama into positions of power. All this talk, once they come into power, they're exactly the same as the Umayyads. Really, the style of leadership is almost the same. So, I don't really buy into this whole idea that the Umayyads were evil and the Abbasids were good. They were both human. Right? They were both human, they had their good and their bad qualities. One of the Umayyads that stands out is Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. I've written an entire book about his life, 300 page book about his life. I highly recommend reading about the life of Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. He was the most pious of the Umayyad rulers and the one who did the most good for this Ummah. So his biography is worth studying in details. So we say the Umayyad Empire ends. There's a plot twist. During the time of Walid ibn Abdul Malik, he was one of the Umayyad rulers. Remember I mentioned that during two reigns, the Muslims conquered a lot of lands. First was Umar and the second is Walid. In the time of Walid, the Muslims conquer all of North Africa, parts of India, Samarkand, and most importantly, Spain. They, con they conquer Spain. So now a part of Europe becomes Islamic, right? Spain becomes a Muslim land and will remain so for 700 years. So when the Abbasids massacre the Umayyads, a story takes place that really sounds like something out of a movie, right? A very young Umayyad prince manages to escape, goes on the run, goes into hiding, spies hunting down, he literally swims across an ocean, he, he disappears for a few years, living under false names, he finds his way into Europe, and the people of Europe are still loyal to the Umayyads because they are the ones who liberated them from, from the Christian rulers, and he establishes a second Umayyad empire in Spain, so the Abbas and the Umayyads are now two separate empires at the same time, and that empire lasts for another 300 years. So some people think the Umayyads lasted for 90 years. In reality, they go on for another 300 years in Spain where they have their golden age. And again, another myth about history at this point. A lot of people think that we had one Khalifa until World War I. It's a complete myth. We only had one Khalifa until the coup by the Abbasids. Once the Abbasids took over, you have the Umayyads in Spain, you have the Abbasids in Baghdad, and many more start to pop up claiming to be Khalifas, right? Because the Ummah now grows too big for one person to handle, for one family to handle. It just grows too big and it starts to split up. Before I continue, I just want to make a note here. A lot of people don't understand how the empire works in terms of Sharia. So here's an important note. The Sharia, or the law of the land, was not handled by the government. This is very important. This is why the law of the land remained the same during the time of the Khulafa Rashidin, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Ottomans, the law of the land remained the same. The law of the land under Islam was actually handled by the ulama. Right? So when the Umayyads came into power, basically you end up with two separate power structures. You have the empires they handle jihad, they handle protecting the borders, they handle taxes, they handle administration, right? That's the role of the Khalifa and his governors, they are handling all of that. The actual making of the laws, or rather interpreting of the Quran and Sunnah, because our laws come from the Quran and Sunnah, the interpretation of the law and the applying of the law and the enforcing of the law is done by the ulama, the fuqaha, the muftis, and most importantly, the qadis. That's why, even for example, when the Abbasids take over, the law of the land doesn't change at all, it's still Sharia, right? Ottomans take over, it's still Sharia. The law stays the same because they had a separate structure. It's not like today, where the government controls everything. Under Sharia, the government barely controls anything, right? Really, under Sharia, there's actually a lot more freedom and there's a lot more levels of power, there's decentralized power. Tribal chiefs have a level of power. Heads of the household have a level of power. Ulama have a level of power. There's decentralized power. The Khalifa basically handles politics, which is jihad, protecting the borders, administration, and collecting and distributing the taxes, right? Which includes the zakat. So the law remains the same. Okay. 
we have half an hour and we've got three more empires to go to. So let's see how quickly we can do this. The Abbasids come into power and they are the empire that lasts the longest. Between, 300, uh, between 600 to 800 years, depending on how you define the end of the Abbasid Empire. Because historically, there's two points that's called the end of the Abbasid Empire. Point number one that most of us know, the Mongols invade, they destroy Baghdad, and that's the end of the Abbasid Khilafat. And for many people, that's the end of the Khilafat because they're the last Quraysh rulers. What many people don't know is that there was a sort of Abbasid ruler after that in Egypt for another 200 years until the Ottomans defeated him. That's why there's a difference of opinion of when the Abbasid Empire <coughs> ends. So the Abbasids come into power, they have the same cycle. They rise, they have a golden age, and then they have a decline, and then they end. But the golden age of the Abbasid Empire is important. It coincides with the golden age of Spain. Because at this point in time, the Muslims become the most powerful empire in the world for 300 years. For a 300 year period, the most powerful people in the world are Abbasid Baghdad and Omeyyad Spain. The Muslims are the most powerful people in the world. Not just in terms of politics, but in terms of technology, in terms of education, in terms of research, in terms of science, in terms of all these things, the Muslims become the world leaders. The rest of the world goes to the Muslim lands to study. They become the dominant power of the world. They influence the world and the influence is still felt today throughout the world. Many of the things we have today are built upon the discoveries made during that time. Many of the policies we have today are built upon policies that they invented. Muslims invented a university system. They invented the idea of medical colleges that you can't be a doctor without a degree. They invented many things that we take for granted today during this golden age. So this is a very important part of our history, the Abbasid golden age. Where the Muslims are wealthy, they have freedom, they have power, they have access to resources, and really we see the Muslims becoming world leaders in every field. Like almost any field you study, if you go back to that point in time, the main people developing those fields at that point in time are Muslims. Muslims develop, invent algebra during this time. Right? So all you kids who are struggling with algebra in school, you can blame the Muslims for that. Right? Our forefathers invented algebra so they can solve inheritance problems and zakat problems. That's what it was invented for. And many other inventions as well. However, the Abbasids are only powerful for about 300 years. After that, we have what I consider the weakest part of our history in terms of power. Where basically the Abbasid ruler becomes just like a, like a figurehead, like a symbolic type of Khalifa, without any real power. And what happens is the Ummah grows too large, each region has its own ruler, and no one really takes the Khalifa seriously anymore. For about 300 years this last, where no one really takes the Khalifa seriously anymore. They pay lip service to him, but he doesn't have any real power. Think of it like what the King of England is like today, right? The King of England today is technically the King of many countries. Do any of those countries take him seriously? Does he actually make laws for those lands? Or is he more of a symbolic role? Right? That's basically what the uh, Khalifat becomes in the late Abbasid era. At the same time that the Abbasids uh, reach the Golden Age, Spain also goes through a Golden Age. So I mentioned the story of the great Umayyad King Abdul Rahman ibn Muawiyah. Study him, amazing story. He flees to Spain, he establishes a separate, separate empire. His descendants rule over Spain for 300 years. This is the introduction of knowledge and civilization to Europe. Before this, Europe is in the Dark Ages. It's a backwards land full of barbarian type of people, right? It's really not considered worth going to, the, it's not considered worth investing in. Muslims come to Spain, they set up schools, they set up universities, they bring in technology, and the rest of Europe learn Arabic, go to their universities, learn from them, take it back to their lands. So for example, during this period, a philosopher comes about in Spain known as Ibn Rushd. Ibn Rushd philosophy, influences the Europeans that leads to the Renaissance and leads to the development of modern philosophy. Right? There is a very immediate impact on Islam and from Islam upon the European world during this period. <coughs> However, no empire lasts forever. The Muslims of Spain, just like every other empire, they rise, they have 300 years of golden age, and then they have the decline. And the decline of Islam in Spain was the first major shock in our history. But this is the first time in our history where the Muslims lose an entire country back to the non-Muslims. Right? This is like 
700 years after the time of the Prophet So imagine, for 700 years, the Muslims are conquering lands and spreading Islam, but they don't ever really lose any major territory for 700 years. And then suddenly what happens is that Spain becomes divided. Muslims start fighting over power. And for, like, for a few hundred years, there's a civil war between the Muslim and Christians, each with their small kingdoms in Spain. And then, the Crusades take place, and the Crusaders inspire in Spain something called the Reconquesta. Reconquesta, to reconquer the land. The Christians reconquer Spain while the Muslims are fighting each other. And they wipe out Islam from Spain completely to such an extent that most Muslims today don't even know that Spain was ever Islamic. Right? Many Muslims don't even have no clue that for 700 years this was a Muslim land. And that this was really, it was such a beautiful Muslim land that people used to call it Jannah on earth. That's how beautiful and well developed it was. So this was like the first major shock in our history that you could lose an entire land and never get it back. It's gone, it's no longer a Muslim land, right? Spain is reconquered. The Muslims and Jews are either exiled or massacred. Interesting note, Judaism survived because of the Muslims, right? Under Islam, Jews and Christians had complete freedom of religion to such an extent that they could even enforce their own Torah and uh, gospel laws in their own communities. So the Jews, they lived in Spain under Muslim rule and they became, they were able to thrive because of that. When the Christians come in and want to massacre everyone, who takes in the Jews? The Ottomans. They move back to a Muslim land under Muslim rule. Really, Islam protected Judaism from falling apart and going extinct because the Christians were always trying to kill them. So while the Spanish Empire is falling apart, the same thing happens to the Abbasids, right? The Abbasid leader doesn't have any real power. He becomes a figurehead, he becomes a, you know, somebody who people say, oh, he's a, he's a Khalifa, I'm just the people. What people were doing that time is, someone would say, oh, he's a Khalifa, I'm just the, the governor. Or he's a Khalifa, I'm just the military leader. But they wouldn't consult the Khalifa in anything and they'll just do their own things. Right? So for about 300 years, there's just a lip service to the Abbas and Khali and Khilafat. And really during this time, when you study this point in history, you almost never study the Khalifas themselves because they're just useless people with like no real power. You study people like Salahuddin Ayyubi and Nuruddin Zinki because these are the people who have actual power. Many of us, we think they were Khalifas, they weren't Khalifas. They were military leaders who pledged allegiance to the Abbas and Khalifa. So about 300 years, the Abbasids are in a state of falling apart. More and more smaller empires are popping up. More and more people are claiming to be the Khalifas. You have the Umayyads in Spain. You have the Fatimids in Egypt. You have other people popping up as well. And then you have other small kingdoms claiming to be following the uh, Abbasids. And then two major events happen that completely devastate the Abbasid Empire. It's the end of the Abbasid Empire, right? The first is the Crusades. So the Crusades was basically Europe waking up. It's the Europeans realizing that they also can have power and they also can, you know, uh, conquer lands. And the Muslims don't really have that border guarded because they didn't really consider the Europeans to be a threat until that point. In 245, in the Byzantiums and others. And so they had that border open so that Europeans could go for pilgrimage to Jerusalem because it's a holy land for Christians and Jews as well. And the Europeans take advantage of that. The Crusaders start. The Crusade is basically a Christian holy war against every other religion, specifically Islam. They enter the Muslim lands. They massacre the Muslims, specifically Jerusalem, Palestine. They take over that land. They rule it for 90 years. There's no Islam allowed in that land at all for the 90 year period. This is one of the most tragic and violent genocides that happened in the history of Islam. 90 years later, a military general by the name of Salahuddin defeats them and takes back Jerusalem. And then a few years later, something even worse happens. The Mongol invasion. So again, just like no one was expecting an attack from the West, from the, from the Crusaders, they weren't expecting any attack from the East either, because to the East were the Mongols. The Mongols were just scattered nomad nomadic tribes. They didn't really have a civilization or an army or a desire to conquer anyone. And then one guy amongst them decides to unite everyone by the name of Genghis Khan, right? Or some people call him Genghis Khan, it's Genghis Khan. He unites everyone and he says, let's conquer. 
And what begins is one of the most barbaric, genocidal, violent conquests in the history of this world, right? The Mongols were so barbaric and violent and unstoppable that the Muslims of that time believed that they were Yajun and Majun and that the world was ending. When you read books written at that time, people were literally writing like the world is ending. Like it's over, that's it, Qiyamah is here. You know how people today think that you know, Qiyamah is here and the world is ending, it was the same. 800 years ago uh, with the Mongols. The Mongols just become unstoppable. And it's really some Muslims' faults. Uh, they were willing to have peace with the Muslims, but the Muslims insulted one of their leaders and they just go on a rampage and start killing everyone. Uh, and then they reach Baghdad. We had time to go over what was Baghdad. Baghdad, for the first half of our history, was the greatest city in the world. Right? Those kids here who play Assassin's Creed, and you see the newest ones built around what Baghdad was like during the Golden Age. You can actually walk around and see what the city was like. It was the most beautiful and well-developed city in the world at that time. It also was considered, you know, untouchable. Yet the Mongols come in and they completely destroy the city, they destroy the Abbasid Empire. This is the end of the Khilafat. Right? For those who believe that the Khilafat has to be from the Quraysh, this is the end of the Khilafat. Right, because what comes after this is not Quraysh. And so, the Ummah enters a stage where there's no Khalifa. And where people think it's the end of the world. And where the Muslims are divided into many small little countries that are war with each other. Sounds familiar. Right? A very similar period to what we're going through today. What we're going through today happened about 600 to 800 years ago. When the Khilafat was abolished, the Muslims were split into many, many empires. And there was no real political unity of power, and everyone's fighting everyone, and people thought the world was ending. But the world didn't end. New empires rose once again. And so we now have specifically four major empires come about. There are many smaller ones, but four major empires come about in this period. First are the Mamluks. The Mamluks are interesting because Mamluk literally means slaves, right? The Mamluks are the slaves of the Abbasids. They have an Abbasid with them saying that he's the Khalifa, but they're the ones who are actually ruling. And they are able to defeat the Mongols. They become the first people to defeat the Mongols. So they maintain control of Jerusalem, Makkah, Medina, Syria, Egypt, basically, you know, the heart of Islam. They maintain control of that part of the world. And uh, they become the Sultanate or the Muslim Kingdom in that part of the world. But uh, they called, they had some kind of legitimacy because they had a legitimacy because they had a Abbasid figurehead with them and they called him the Khalifa, right? At the same time, some of the Shia in Persia, they also gather and fight back against the Mongols and they form their own empire called the Safavid Empire that also lasts for a very uh, long time. Uh, at the same time, what's most amazing to me is that some of the Mongols convert to Islam. Some of the Mongols who conquer the Muslim world convert to Islam and from their descendants come new Muslim empires. One that's most relevant to us and that we really need to study is the Mughal Empire. The Mughal Empire were basically Mongol descendants who were Muslims that ruled over India in what became India's golden age. Right? India, under the Muslim rulers, was the wealthiest country in the world. That's why the British wanted to colonize it. They wanted that wealth. Right? It's not the India we see today. It's very important that we study the history of the Mughals, of the Mughal Empire, because it's a forgotten part of our history that directly affects many of us. It's how we got to where we are, right? So the Mughal Empire are the descendants of the Mongols that ruled over India. India goes through a golden age under the Mughal Empire. The most important of the empires that arise at that time is the Ottoman Empire. So what is the Ottoman Empire? And that's the last empire we will discuss before we finish off. Basically, a group of nomadic Turks realized that they need to form some cities because they're being attacked from both sides. They have the Crusaders on one side, they have the Mongols on the other side. They can't keep moving from city to city, right? Those of you who've watched Eturul or the Usman series, you know what I'm talking about. By the way, the series are mostly fictional, but some aspects of it is true, right? So basically, they form a few towns and cities and they become like a small little kingdom that's fighting off the Crusaders and the Mongols. But here's the point I want us to think about, and I want us to, to, to realize. The, the Ottomans started with a small kingdom of just a few towns, and within 300 years, 
They become the mightiest empire in the world and the Khilafat. Today, we think that for the Khilafat to be restored, you know, there's going to be some magic thing where there's like a Khilafat over the whole Muslim world. But after the downfall of the Abbasid Khilafat, it took 300 years for another empire to rise up to that level. Right? And realistically, if that's going to happen again, it's also going to take about 200 to 300 years. It's not likely that you're going to see it in your lifetime. Right? But many people want everything to happen quickly. That's not how history happens. So two things the Ottomans do that really establish their power in this world. Number one, they conquer Constantinople. Constantinople was the capital of the Byzantium Empire. It was considered unconquerable. It was the capital of the Byzantines for a thousand years. And the Prophet ﷺ had prophesied that one day Muslims will conquer that land. And over 800 years later, the Ottomans conquer Constantinople. The Byzantine Empire is no more. And Constantinople today, what do we know it as? It's Istanbul. Istanbul was the capital of the Roman Empire for a thousand years. So this now becomes the capital of the Ottoman Empire for the next 600 years. And this becomes the heartland of Islam for the next 600 years. Constantinople becomes Istanbul, becomes the most important city in the Muslim world. And then, feeling confident from the conquest of Constantinople, the Ottomans sort of turn on the Muslim uh, the co-rulers, remember that many empires at the same time, and they fight the Mamluks, and they take over Jerusalem and Makkah and Medina from the Mamluks. Why is this important? This is important because now the Ottomans rule Constantinople, the center of Rome, and they, they rule Makkah, Medina, and Jerusalem, the holy lands of Islam. That's why when you read the biographies of the Ottoman rulers of this time, they will call themselves the Sultan, the Caesar of Rome, and the Khalifa of the Muslim world, and the custodian of the holy lands. Because they were all in one, right? And they become the most powerful empire in the world. Imagine that, 300 years before this, Muslims thought the world was ending. They thought the Khilafat is abolished, Yajud and Majud are here, and the world is ending. 300 years later, again, the Muslims are the most powerful nation on earth. It happened multiple times in our history, it can happen again. Right? I'm very confident it could happen again when another empire rises, maybe in our lifetime, or in the next generation or two. So they become this massive empire spread across Europe, Asia, and Africa. A lot of the Balkans, a lot of what is today Russia used to be part of the Ottoman Empire. That's why there's many Muslims living there. Uh, really, they become the size of what is today 50, uh, uh, 25 to 50 countries with 25 million people. At the height of Ottoman power, there were 25 million people living in the empire. One of the tragedies of our history curriculum is most of us don't know anything about the Ottoman Empire. And the more I study it, the more I'm amazed by the systems they developed and the structures they developed and how organized they were and some of the great people that came out of this empire. So the Muslims go through a third golden age, an Ottoman golden age. The Ottomans are the dominant superpower on earth. I forgot to mention, one of the things that made the Ottomans more powerful at that time is that they weaponized gunpowder. They're known as the gunpowder kingdom. So they developed cannons and guns, that's how they were able to conquer Constantinople. Uh, the enemy were fighting it with bow and arrows and swords and they were using muskets and cannons. Right? So again, the Muslims are even the most technologically developed empire of that time. So many of us may be wondering, so how, the, how in the world did we get to this? Right? The mighty Abbasids, Muslims of Spain, the Mughals, the Ottomans, and today we are at the bottom of the bottom. I don't know. Uh, real countries to look up to, no way to stop a genocide from happening, no real political power. How did we get to where we are? That will be the final part of today's presentation. The Ottomans, like every other empire, go through a decline. And their decline is it's dealing with several major factors at the same time. Number one is colonization and the rise of the European powers. So, many people think that the Ottomans were going downhill and the Europeans were going uphill. In reality, the Ottomans sort of stagnated and the Europeans overtook them, right? Because the Europeans at this point go through the Renaissance, they develop the, they go to colonization, they conquer many different lands, including many Muslim lands, Egypt, India become part of the British Empire, the Dutch conquer Indonesia and Malaysia, and you know, many of the Muslim lands are now becoming colonized. 
So this weakens the Muslim world. Right? Colonization weakens the Muslim world. At the same time, uh, the, the, you know, the Ottomans have to fight wars on multiple fronts. The war that affects them the most financially is with Russia. Russia fights the Ottomans for 300 years over Constantinople. Because Russia before modernity was a religious Christian empire. And they wanted the uh, Constantinople back. They considered it part of their Christian heritage. So for 300 years there is a war between Russia and the Ottomans. That's why many of these lands that are today part of Russia, uh, that have Muslim people in it, then those used to be Ottoman lands. Right? So this really cripples the Ottoman Empire financially, this war. At the same time, they're fighting other wars. Uh, nationalism starts to happen. People want their own nation states. They want not to be ruled by Turks anymore. Right? Uh, the Saudi rebellion takes place. Many people are unaware of this. They think Saudi Arabia is a one-stop thing. Saudi Arabia is actually the third Saudi kingdom. It's actually the third Saudi kingdom. Twice before that, the Saudis took over Ottoman territories and declared their own kingdom and the Ottomans had to fight them and take the lands back. Right? So there's an ongoing war between the Saudis and the Ottomans for about 300 years as well. At the same time, the British are trying to get rid of the Khilafat. The British are doing everything because they see the Ottomans as their main enemy, right? the main obstacle to colonization, to taking over the world. And so there's a lot of spies in the Ottoman Empire, there's a lot of strategies to destabilize it from the inside. Really, the Ottomans are fighting too many wars on too many different fronts at the same time, including internally. And the economic factors lead to a period of decline, and really, at one point, the, the, the Ottoman Empire goes bankrupt. And in the 1800s, they tried to salvage the empire. They tried to develop new systems of education, new systems of economics, new policies, a new leadership style, a new army. They basically tried to modernize the Khilafat. Many of us wonder what a modern Khilafat would look like. If you look at the Khilafat of the 1800s, you can see the Ottomans making an attempt to modernize the Khilafat to work within the new world. Uh, I don't really agree with everything they did, but at least they tried to do something. At least they tried to make it work with everything, all the changes that were happening in the world. And this new Khilafat, this new version of the Ottomans, which was now a modern type of empire, it never really stood a chance because while all of these developments are taking place and while they're coming up with these new policies and new systems, an event happens. Many people don't know this, but this event is one of the most important events in Muslim history. World War I. Right? Again, if we think of World War I, we think this is British history, this is Russian history, this is Austrian history, this is German history. No, this is after the Mongol invasion and the fall of Spain, this is the most important tragic event in our history. Because the Ottomans get dragged into World War I. Right? Basically, all of the superpowers of the world get split into two sides. The Allied powers, Russia, UK, USA, France, and the Central powers, Germany, Hungary, and the Ottomans, and a few others. And long story short, the Central Powers lose the war. The Central Powers lose the war. The British and the French literally conquer the Muslim world. 100 years ago, the British and the French conquered the Muslim world. And they split it up into all these small countries we see today. And they divided it in such a way that none of these countries have the resources to be completely independent. And they have to depend on them for something. And they set in place policies to ensure that a Khilafat never rises again. Muslims never grow as powerful as the Ottomans again. There are many other things that take place at this time as well. The rise of Zionism. Right? The Zionism rises up during this time as well. So the Zionists, they come about during the late years of the Ottomans. And they want Palestine. They really, really want Palestine. And Sultan Abdul Hamid, the last great Ottoman ruler, he tells him, as long as we are around, you're not getting this land. This is Ottoman land. This is Muslim land. You can live there, you're free to live there, but it's under Sharia, it's a Muslim land. So the Zionists, they basically fund the British war in World War I. They ally with the British and they make a deal with the British that if, if you defeat the Ottomans, you're giving us that land. But some of the Arabs also betray the Ottomans and they make the same deal with the British. That you're giving us that land. So the British defeat the Ottomans, they take over that land, the Arabs and the Zionists both want it. 
And meanwhile, there's people living there that's indigenous to the land, the Palestinians. And so it gets split up into Jordan, Palestine, and Israel. Many people don't realize this, but Jordan actually is supposed to be Palestine as well. Right? What is today Jordan is literally supposed to be Palestine. It was just their way of compromising with the Arabs that they promised that land to. And so the mess we are in today is a result of World War I. We are still living in the aftermath of World War I. Many people don't know this. Because in World War I, the Ottoman Khilafat is abolished in 1924, exactly 100 years ago. Right? The Ottoman Khilafat is abolished. It's been exactly 100 years without a Khalifa. Right? What followed is the division of the Muslim world into many empires, into many kingdoms. And all of these many kingdoms don't really have that much power. They don't really have that much natural resources. <coughs> Furthermore, the Muslim world is bombarded with forced secularism and liberalism. Right? The most uh, obvious example being Turkey. Turkey, if you know what happened to Turkey after World War I for the next 30 or 40 years, secularism was forced on the people. Right? People's beards were literally ripped off, their hijab was ripped off their head. It goes through a forced secularism. They basically, they have this idea that if you just force secularism on the Muslims, they'll give up their religion and they'll, you know, they want to be like us. But this backfires. Because over the past 50 years, all over the world, we have seen a revival of Islam. Really, over the past 50 years, Islam has been on the rise again. Just like it was on the rise in the beginning, just like it was on the rise about 50 years after the, the Mongols defeated the Muslims. It's on the rise again today. In many different ways, in many different ways, the Muslim world has been on a rise again in the past 50 years, despite everything that the enemies of Islam have done to make sure that Muslims give up their religion and never grow powerful again. One of the most ironic things that has led to the rise of Islam again is that when they took over the Muslim lands and made these economies poor and made uh, destabilize these lands, lots of Muslims migrated to their lands. Right? Muslims migrated to their lands, Islam starts spreading in their lands, people from their lands start converting to Islam, and now suddenly the British are worried that the UK is too Islamic. Right? And that within 50 years it's going to be an Islamic land. That whole plan of this backfires. Islam is now spreading globally at a rate that they cannot understand. They tried to force atheism, they tried to force liberalism, they tried to force secularization. Yet Islam is spreading so fast that by, the 90, by 2050, it may be the largest religion in the world. It's already the second largest. And not only is Islam growing in terms of numbers, but spiritually, there are more practicing Muslims in the world today than they were 50 years ago. Especially than they were 80 years, 70 or 80 years ago. Intellectually, we have far more access to Islamic knowledge and far more Islamic resources today than we had even 30 years ago. Most of us here know this, 30 years ago we didn't have access to the resources we have today. You can study anything about Islam today at the touch of a button and people are doing so. Right? You have seen an intellectual rise of Islam. We now have a level of scholarship that was you know, unthinkable for a long period of time. That we have intellectual Muslim scholars all over the world. Economically, they did everything they can to ensure that Muslim countries would stay poor forever. But over the past 30 years, at least four or five Muslim countries are doing well economically. And there may be more in the next 10 or 20 years. As they start to work together, as they start to help each other, as they start to develop new ways of growing. That now there are actual Muslim countries that are amongst the most economically prosperous in the world. That are good places to live. That where, you know, life is good again. And inshallah more Muslim countries will be like that. So I say, and this is my conclusion. My conclusion is that many people have a negative doom and gloom attitude towards history. Many people have this idea that, oh, we're living in the end times, we just wait for Mahdi. Right? Nothing's gonna happen, our Mahdi's gonna come, and then only everything's gonna come right. I don't really believe we're living in the end times. Only Allah knows best when the end times could happen. It could be 10 years time, it could be a thousand years time. Right? People 800 years ago thought they were living in the end times. And look what happened. I believe we are going through the cycle again where Islam is on the rise, intellectually, spiritually, and economically. What comes next? The political revival of Islam, the revival of Sharia, the revival of Khilafat. I believe 
that a new Muslim global power will arise within the next 200 years. And there will be another mighty Muslim empire. And there will be another Muslim golden age. And there will be another war. Allah knows best how long that will go on before the end of the world. But I don't believe in this doom and gloom attitude that the world is over, Qiyamah is closed, let's just do nothing and let's wait for the Mahdi. I don't agree with that attitude. I think we can all contribute to the rise of Islam and the revival of Islam in our own way. Whether it's intellectually, whether it's economically, whether it's spiritually, we all can play a role in seeing Islam rise up again one more time, just like we did so many times. Our history is a history of every time they pushed us down, we got back up. May take a hundred years, but it kept happening. And inshallah, it will happen again within our lifetime. With that, alhamdulillah, we come to the end of our presentation. Alhamdulillah, we're able to do it in exactly one hour. So yeah, that's 1,400 years of political history in one hour. If you want to learn about it in more details, I have an online course where it teaches across 30 hours going into a lot of details of each empire. Um, it's a very popular online course, over 2,000 students. Uh, I highly recommend if you want to learn about this in more details, you can do the online course. And I highly, highly recommend that we as a community, we start studying our history again. Introduce it to school curriculum, introduce it to madrasa curriculums, read books on these topics, discuss it as families, we need to reconnect with our past. There are so many amazing things about our past that we just completely disconnected from. We must revive the study of history. So with the alhamdulillah, we come to the end of today's session. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll take now. And uh, if not, we'll close up. By the way, my new book is out, uh, 25 Keys to a Happy Life of the Quran and Sunnah. It's my latest book. Uh, it's normally 250, but today it's on sale for 200. So, <clears throat> you start off talking about <clears throat> Ibn Baldur's theory of rise and fall of nations, empires. Um, um, what we've seen over the last hundred years, obviously, this post trauma of colonialism is an attempt at modernization. Right? So, obviously, you have the extreme liberal form of modernization in the form of uh, uh, Mustafa Kamal, and then you also have within Ulama circles like Muhammad Abdul and Jamal al Ghani, they're trying to modernize Islam, move to science and technology, let's throw away the rave, let's try to take material interpretations of Quran, let's try to pursue science and technology, and then we'll be equal to the place. Obviously, this comes with the trauma, so it mustn't be too harsh in our judgment. Um, but how do you understand the rise of all nations? Allah in the Quran, my righteous servants shall inherit the earth. Is it purely about pursuing uh, science, technology, just research and development, pursuing economic growth, pursuing uh, <clears throat> tertiary education pursuing wars and then the rise of civilization, or is it something that is not necessarily um, a one to one relationship between military, economic, and political, or is this spiritual thing Allah gives it to whom He wants when He wants, despite the best attempts? So, the way nations rise will change from time to time, place to place. There's no one model of a, of a rise, right? Uh, I think the spiritual aspect is important to get Allah's help on the side of the Muslims, right? But obviously the intellectual and economical aspects are just as important. But just going back a little bit, what we saw on the other side of history over the past hundred years was the rise of modernity, the rise of Western powers, the rise of uh, the liberal world order. And what we've seen over the past ten years is the decline of that entire system. And the decline of that system is going to lead to the rise of something new, which could be a new Muslim empire and one of those new things that pop up. Because we are now living in what many, even what many non-Muslim professors call post-modernity. They call it post-modernity because the younger generation, even many of the non-Muslims, the younger generation, have lost faith in modernity. They see modernity as the previous century. They have actually skeptical about modernity. They're skeptical about capitalism. They're skeptical about feminism. They're skeptical about uh, of democracy, they're skeptical about you know the, the giving a letting go of religion. Uh, people are very skeptical even about things like education and medicine. <laughs> you know, we now have rights of skeptics in every field. So that means something new is going to come out, right? This is actually a void where Islam can go, where you and we don't know how it will happen. Really, uh, one of the roles of the intellectual of our time is to figure out the way forward. There is no roadmap. There is no roadmap. It's something that will happen organically, and it's something that will happen when Allah wills it. 
And there are many verses in the Quran that indicate the rise and falls, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that He alternates power between people. Now, every empire comes and it goes. If certain empires are on their way out right now, new empires will come in their place, right? Uh, I actually think the next Muslim power will probably come from Palestine. That Allah is preparing that land to be the heart of the next Muslim empire. What they're going through now is, is similar to what uh, the Turks went through that they're being attacked from both sides by the Mongols and the Crusaders and it looked like there was no way out there and they became a mighty empire. Right? Only Allah knows how it's going to play out. Uh, we need intellectuals to figure out the way forward. For me, the biggest obstacle to the rise of Islam right now is the nation-state model. Because Muslims are divided into nationalities, very tiny nation-states that don't like each other, that don't get along. And this is completely haram actually. I believe the nation-state model is haram. Because we are dividing Muslims in a way that creates animosity and in a way that hinders the freedom that the Sharia wanted us to have. The freedom to live anywhere in the Muslim world. So one of the major changes that will have to happen eventually is to let go of the nation-state model and find some new middle path of where you have a nation-state model but it's, there's some open borders and a lack of national hatred. I don't know how it's going to happen. And also the other uh, what the other point I was going to make about the rise and fall of nations. Yeah, sorry, other points in my mind. But yeah, there, there is no one way forward. Uh, we, we are seeing Islam rise in many ways, and I don't know what's next. Yeah. Sorry, other points in my mind, yeah? So, uh, actually, the, actually, I was supposed to make that point earlier, that this presentation is the political history. While the political history is happening, there's the history of Abu Hanifa, and Imam Bukhari, and the Oliya, and the ulama, and the average person, and the farmers, and the businessmen, and you know, all of this is going on. So, when you study political history, it's very dark, and right? politics is all bad things. But if you actually look at the life of the average person on the ground, uh, life was good for the average person. And it didn't really change much from one empire to the next. We have separate history. You can study the history of the ulama, right? And you will find a very strong spiritual history throughout all of these generations. Uh, the history of the ODI is the same thing, right? So one of the points I mentioned earlier is when, when the empire grew too big and became a monarchy system, the ulama became a separate type of power from the rulers. They became a separate type of power. Uh, the ulama, for example, the Qadis in the Ottoman Empire, they could pass a fatwa that the Ottoman Khalifa is no longer going to be Khalifa and someone else can take his place. Right? They could hold the Khalifa accountable. So they were a separate power structure. And they have their own history. And that history is a bit more, uh, more nicer. Right? They did more stories of of spirituality, of piety, of nice things happening. Uh, it's just when you study politics, it's more studying all of these things, right? Um, so, also the other point I want to mention on that, when we study history, I don't like us to only study political history. It's actually more important for us to learn the lives of the righteous so we can benefit from their life stories, right? Uh, and the righteous, historically, most of them avoid the politics. They consider politics to be something they just don't want to get involved with. That's why the names don't pop up anywhere over here. Because one, once, once the empire grows to be like, we be staying away from the politics, we we'll focus on the Sharia, we we'll focus on fiqh, we we'll focus on hadith, we we'll focus on teaching the people, but we're not getting involved in, you know, fighting over kingdoms. So yes, there's all the other types of history happening at the same time. And we could do that some other time. So one of the points you mentioned, um, I think maybe we need to expand on it, was when the Ottomans defeated the uh, Valentine, it was because of gunpowder. And if you look at political history, it's who has the biggest military might that wins, not necessarily you know all the other things that we have, economic power and so on. Whoever had the best army, 
most uh, equipped army, most sophisticated army, um, military prowess on the battlefield, they are the people that came into power. So military power, uh, military might was an important part of this whole thing. Yeah. One of the problems over the past 20 years with our Islamic discourses, because of the trauma from 9-11, Muslims took a very passive approach to our religion. And we started kind of like putting down concepts like jihad and military power. And a lot of people who became very passive during that point in time, in the past eight months, have been telling me, I now understand why jihad exists. I now understand why the Prophet needed an army, why Muslims of the past needed armies. Because I always thought, I thought this whenever I thought history. I said, history, if you study it, you realize the way this world is, it's conquer or be conquered. That's the way of the world. And really, we have to get back that warrior spirit as a Ummah. And victory is not going to really come militarily until Muslims develop strong armies and they're able to fight back and they're able uh, to, to take back that region. Like I said, what we are in right now is still the aftermath of World War I. We haven't moved from that base yet. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's exactly what's going on in Israel and Palestine at the moment. Is that what? So you're very. Uh, what you mentioned is, is, is exactly that. That we need a military revival amongst the Muslims. That would be necessary because you know they say why don't the Muslim armies countries do anything about it? Let's face it. Most Muslim countries, if they even do anything about it, they'll be wiped out in a few days. They just that's how powerless these countries are. So yes, redeveloping a proper Muslim army is necessary, and this is why. We need to move away from that pacifist understanding of Islam, where jihad is just jihad of the nafs, and you know, there's no conquest in our religion, and you know, there's a hippie idea of the religion of peace. No, our, our, our Allah, in His wisdom, gave our religion a military component because Allah knows throughout history there will be people trying to kill the Muslims. And if Muslims don't have might, they will be as they were with the Mongols, as they were with the Crusaders, as they are today, on the receiving end. Right? So there is wisdom behind every law that Allah has revealed, including the laws related to jihad of conquest and attaining military power. It's actually a verse in Surah Al-Anfal about the importance of building military power so your enemies don't attack you. I mean, that was what Al-Qaeda was all about, the, the pan-Islamic army, yeah. consisting of people from different countries fighting colonization. Obviously, you know, the rest is history. But it was a pan-Islamic army because they saw the importance of uh, military might mm -hmm in confronting the West. Uh, obviously, you know, there were lots of other issues which came with Al-Qaeda. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, I just wanted to repeat back the the point about the difference between the ulama and the, and, like, the government that was running. So I understand they were like, separate, but so if you gave an example of you take the game of fatwa that so and so was not what you do, were they taken heed by, by the leaders? Or were they, were they more like, like they just didn't make the politics? I'm sorry, my hearing is gone now. <laughs> you get the silver point in the line with my hearing also. Okay, so um, there was a difference between like, the government and the rulers and the ulama. Yeah. So when the ulama gave a ruling on something, was it taken heed by the, by the rulers? Or was, was it taken seriously with the government? Yeah. So the government didn't have power over the law. Yeah. They had, they had the, the, basically, when it came to the law, people would take their fatwas of the ulama, and they would take, if they had a problem, they would go to a party, a judge or whatever the court, the court was a Ali, right? And whatever the court decides they will do, right? So in Islamic law, see, the, the, the way we used to in modernity, we have government laws and we have Islamic law, right? And sometimes they clash. Islam, historically, the Muslims had the Sharia, which the ulama interpreted and the ulama taught and the ulama judged by. And then on issues that the Sharia is silent about, like, Things like uh, taxes and uh, things like uh, property ownership in certain areas and traffic laws, things like that, those things the government handled, right? So, for example, the Ottoman Empire had the Sharia and it had Qanun, canon law. The Sharia and canon law. The Sharia was handling halal and haram, wajib, judging between people, marriage, divorce, business, all of that was handled by Sharia. That was handled by the Sheikh of Islam, the bodies, the judges, the ulama. The canon law was more to do with taxes, more to do with uh, traffic laws, more to do with uh, education laws, things that the Sharia is silent on. 
right? And that was handled by the government, but what happens later on is they actually, they bring the ulama in to help them with that as well, right? Because the, one of the things throughout our history, uh, one interesting point throughout our history is that the Khalifa is always trying to prove that he's a legitimate Khalifa. Because everyone's, every Khalifa, every empire came into power through defeating another Muslim empire. So there's always people who are like, these guys took over our land. They fought Muslims to take over our land. So every empire wants to prove they're a legitimate Khalifa. The way they do it is by letting Sharia be the law of the land. If they interfere with Sharia, people will rebel against them. If they try to change the Sharia, people will rebel against them. And the ulama would lead the rebellion against them. Right? So they wouldn't touch it, they wouldn't go near it. They'd say, this is your world, you the ulama, you the experts, you handle it. We focus on our thing. Right? Because they knew any attempt to mess with the Sharia would cause rebels, rebellions, right? And cause people to turn against them. So that's why they didn't really interfere with that. But they did make laws on secondary issues that Islam doesn't talk about. Like Islam doesn't tell you what traffic laws should be. So it's perfectly fine for the ruler to make traffic laws and for people to follow that. I mean, there are incidents. There are many incidents. So Abu Hanifa died in jail, Ibn Taymiyyah died in jail, because there were points in their life where there's a clash, right? And where, so you find, for example, one scholar would look for 90 years, and we may be at one year in those 90 years in the clash between him and the Khalifa, and he goes to jail, and then the rest of it is separate. So there are clashes taking place, but not like it's an everyday thing or it's happening all the time. It's more like when the Khalifa does something that seems to be changing the Sharia, uh, then they would step up. So one good example of this in early history, in the time of the Sahaba, uh, there was a tyrant governor who tried, because people, you know, Eid Salah, the Qutbah is after the Salah, right? So when this tyrant was giving the Eid Qutbah, uh, people used to go away, they didn't want to listen to you speak. So he flipped it around and he started giving the Qutbah before the Salah. The ulama stood up and criticized him, said, this is Bida, you can't change the religion. Right? And they stood up and they criticized him and they rebelled against him until he went back to the sunnah of having a khutbah after salah. Right? And when he told him that people are not staying for my khutbah, they said, that's your problem. <laughs> if you don't give me good khutbahs, it's your problem. <laughs> you can't change the religion because nobody likes your khutbah. So they didn't take a step. And that's why you find many of the biographies of our scholars, there is this point where they are martyred or they are in jail because they were very vocal when they were trying to change Allah's law. Alhamdulillah, excellent questions today. I think we can close off now, unless there's any other important questions. Alhamdulillah, uh -huh. Jazakallah. Just, I just want to know, you know, the, the, your quote that you mentioned, is that political or is it like both? It's both. Like, life is messy, everything's a bit of a boat, right? Uh, in their view, it's not politics, it's defending Allah's Sharia against politicians. <laughs> That's what we need. She's asking about your course, of course. Mm -hmm. Your course. About your course. Oh, my course. Oh, is it political? Yeah. My course online is the political history. Mm -hmm. It's just the political history. Although I do, I do discuss the uh, what you call it, the, the scientific developments as well. So I have like two hours going to all the science that Muslim developed, what the key sciences are. But 90% of the course is political history, and then I do the three hours of the history of the Madhabs, because I think that's a part of our history that's very much understood how and why the Madhabs developed and what was the necessity of the Madhabs. Uh, but 90% of the course is politics, right? It's going into the Ottoman Empire for eight hours, going into the Abbas Empire for four hours, uh, just breaking it down in that level, and uh, yeah, it's a political course. Okay. Is that the